I'm not sure that the journalism is always lazy, and I'm a great supporter of um, media who are accountable. That is, if you uh, find that they have published something that is untrue, they are obliged to correct it. So how do you keep speaking up? Well, I don't know. I've been um, doing that since the late 60s, and every time, of course, that you appear in public in any way, somebody's going to attack you. There was a um, great piece on Mary Beard recently in which she talked about the tradition that those who'd speak in public have for the last three or thousand years or so been men. So if you were not a man and you say just about anything in public, you're going to get a certain onslaught of people who uh, send you hate mail, which used to just be in, in colored block lettering and now is on the internet and it says things like I'm going to cut off your head and rape it and if Mary Beard can deal with that so can I so The Handmaid's Tale was written in 1984 um, sorry to have been so corny um, but of course, yes, George or Orwell was one of the earlier people who wrote um, books of that kind. And it was important to me at that time because the 1980s was a decade of pushback. And what it was pushing back against was the uh, uprising of many kinds of different sorts of feminism in the 1970s. And it was a decade in which people were already saying that they would like to reverse all of this, that they would like uh, women to be back in the home, in their rightful sphere, and that all of the gains that people thought they had, had made ought to be reversed. And so The Handmaid's Tale was partly an answer to the question, if you were going to shove, back, uh, shove women back into the home and deprive them of all of these gains they thought they had made, how would you do that? And what you would do is simply reverse the steps that had led to their being out and active in the world with jobs and control of their own property and those things that they had by that time. You would roll that back and there was already a quite quick and easy mechanism for doing that and that was the credit card. So anything digital will allow that switch to be thrown instantaneously, just saying. Okay, in 1984, when I started The Handmaid's Tale on a German uh, keyboard typewriter, which I had rented, it, it helped not to be able to touch type because it's less confusing if you have to look anyway. Uh, Berlin was encircled by the Berlin Wall. It was a showpiece of a kind for uh, Western capitalist merchandising, but it was also a very uh, shadowed place. And uh, it was populated by a lot of elderly ladies who had been through the war also by a number of young men evading the draft, because if you lived in West Berlin, you didn't have to be drafted into the German army. Um, but not a lot of young families, because it was a precarious place. Every Sunday, the East German Air Force would do a flyby in which they would make sonic booms, just to remind you that they were there. That was very um, atmospherically inspiring by which I mean that people were very reluctant to talk to you unless they had um, a safe place to do it in and unless they were pretty certain that you weren't going to blow their cover. So I did a certain amount of that. It was pretty instructive. How afraid people were of saying anything that was going to get them in trouble and how careful people from the West had to be not to go back and say, and so-and-so told me this, and so-and-so told me that. When it came out in 85-6, there were various reactions. 
in England it was a jolly good yarn, but no thanks. We did our Oliver Cromwell moment back in the 17th century, so it didn't feel as if they were about to have a um, a religious puritanical regime or a civil war. I, I still don't think people think they're going to have a religious puritanical regime, but the civil war is already kind of going on right now. It's just, it's not war. It's it's um, the Brexit split. There is there are two Englands. Um, so even that part becomes a bit more believable. In Canada, Canadians are always so nervous. They said, oh, could it happen here? And um, right now, maybe not, but, but we just had a government that was doing a lot of things. Uh, one before this was doing a lot of things that, that Trump is now doing. So none of these are certainties anymore. And as for the United States, uh, the, the pushback is in full swing. You're seeing women's reproductive rights being rolled back at a very swift pace. So in 85, it was nervously in the United States, um, how long have we got? And uh, conditions changed overnight on November the 9th of last year. So the two previous elections were we dodged the bullet and, and this one not. That's why you saw those big marches. So yes, it's being read very differently. Unfortunately, I'm not pleased. Ursula Le Guin has a very good thing on anger in which she says anger is a tool. Um, so you have a tool, it's a powerful tool, um, and you, you use that tool, but then you have to do the hard slog of making real changes. The, the uh, name, shame, and blame actually only works with people who are in the public eye and have something to lose by loss of public favor. So that would include people in the entertainment industry, it would include politicians, and it would include CEOs of publicly traded corporations that sell things to the public. Um, if you're making um, widgets for tanks, you're not in that category. So that, that means a vast uh, penumbra uh, where, this, where these techniques are not um, very effective. In all of this, you need to go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the companion document that has to do with women and see what the rights are actually supposed to be. It is like those jokes they used to make about communism and Christianity, good idea, never been tried yet. But at least it gives you an idea of what the standard is and what people, what people signed, <laughs> what they're supposed to be doing. Otherwise, you don't have anything to, to base your demand for rights upon. So the third area that we've been hearing a lot about is social behavior. So what is supposed to go on, what is expected to go on in the, in the area of what we could loosely call dating? And this is something that is, um, young people are gonna have to sort that out. And, uh, and they're going to have to come up with an idea of how they would like it to be that's different from what it is. And I think one thing that happened between, say, 1960 and, and now is the advent of, of the pill, which changed everything. It meant that because you could, you had to. And people have to have a rethink about that. And the other thing I think that happened was the hookup culture, you know, dating apps. And the other thing that happened was the pornographication of the imagination. So why should anybody be expected to have such a rotten time, <laughs> which, we, which we are hearing they are not having a good time? Now, I hated being 22, but not for those reasons. 
different reasons. What is the greatest threat? The greatest threat is um, ocean death, because should the oceans die, the marine algae that made our oxygen atmosphere 1.9 billion years ago, before which iron didn't rust because it was methane, uh, if those organisms die, 60 to 80 percent of the oxygen that we breathe dies with them. So we'll still be wheezing, but for how long? So fix that one, and then you at least have a groundwork for fixing the other things. It's a multiple problem.